everybody. Um, my name is Dave, and uh, I'm one of the elders here at Cornerstone, and it's great to be able to bring God's Word uh, to you this morning. We're going to be starting a new series this morning in the book of Philippians, and we're going to be considering this book over seven Sundays. Um, it'd be great if you could keep it open in front of you, and you might want to follow along on the handout. Um, there's not a lot on there, but you can, you can sort of see where I'm going. Um, let me pray. Let's ask for God's help uh, as we come to his Word. In the book of Ephesians, we're told that the Lord Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. Heavenly Father, we we thank you that you love us, you love your people, and we're here this morning because you love us and the Lord Jesus has loved us and given himself up for us. We thank you, Lord, that we're precious to you more than we deserve. And Father, we pray as we think about Philippians, as we think about what it tells us about the church and what we should be, what we should do, we pray you'd help us to listen carefully, that we might be a people who are devoted to bringing glory to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to ask the question, what are we doing here? What should we be doing here? What should our vision be, our goal be for Cornerstone Church? What are we aiming at? Um, What should we be trying to do? And how do we evaluate whether or not we're doing the right things? I'm not just talking about Sunday services. I'm talking about everything we do. What about our relationships with one another? How should we think about those? Many of us here would call ourselves members of Cornerstone Church. But what does that mean? What does, it, what does it involve? What should it mean? It involves being here on a Sunday, but, but what else? I want you to imagine that the Apostle Paul had written us uh, a letter and said that he's going to come and stay with us for a few weeks. Um, he'll, be, he'll be here for a few weeks with us, observing all the things that we do. Paul was the expert church planter, wasn't he? He established many, many churches. And if anyone had the answer to what a church should do and how the people in the church are to relate to one another, well, it should be him. What do you think he'd be hoping to see when he came to visit? What would the model church look like? Well, this morning as we start this book of Philippians, we're going to begin to see the answer The church in Philippi was a church that Paul had established, uh, and you can read about it in Acts chapter 16, and this letter was written about 10 years uh, after the church had started, Um, so a bit older than Cornerstone Church, but not much older. And this church in Philippi was was not without its problems. Paul's going to address some of the problems later on in the letter, if you read it, but actually perhaps more than any other church that Paul wrote to, or at least of the letters that we have in our Bibles, it's clear that Paul's overriding emotion as he thinks about this church is not anxiety and not fear, but joy and thanks. Every time he thinks of them, there's joy in his heart. He bursts into thanks. To God. As he thinks of this church, his mind is not jumping to all the things that they get wrong, but he's quickly giving thanks for all the things that they're getting right by God's grace. In our passage this morning, we're going to see what Paul loves about this church most of all. And that ought to tell us what would he hope to see if he came to Cornerstone Church. And we'll also see in the second part of the passage, what's Paul's prayer for this church? What's what's he hoping for? Which again ought to tell us what he'd be praying for us and what he'd be hoping for us if he was with us. So let's have a look at um, the Paul, Paul's prayer of thanks in verse 3 to 8. We're going to think about the source of Paul's joy And we're going to just first take a closer look at Paul's joy. Just have a look at verse 3. It really is overwhelming joy that he feels for this church. I thank my God every time I remember you. 
In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. He's thankful, he's joyful. He's confident, he says in verse 6. Look at verse 7, he says, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you. It's not just that his feeling is justified. It's right. It's necessary. He's obliged to feel like this. His joy and his thanks and his confidence are how he ought to feel about this church. Look at the second half of verse 7. He says, he has them in his heart. And verse 8, he says, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul has a deep affection for this church, doesn't he? He longs for them with the affection that Jesus has for them. It's sacrificial love, like Jesus has for us. He gave himself up for the church. That's the kind of love Paul has for these people. This is not a church that is out of sight, out of mind, is it? You know, you think about Paul, and you read the, the book of Acts, you would think, wouldn't you, with all the things that Paul had on his plate, you know, the amount of places that he'd visited, the amount of churches that he'd planted, you would think, and you know, a church that he'd planted 10 years earlier would just easily slip out of his mind. But no, they're on Paul's mind regularly and in his prayers regularly. He is absolutely overwhelmed with joy and thanks when he thinks about this church. Later on in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says they are his joy. But why? Before we answer that question, we ought to recognize something else. Something that, that makes his joy and his thanks all the more remarkable. It's remarkable because of where Paul was writing from. He was in prison. Look at chapter 1, verse 13. Paul says that he's in chains for Christ. And he literally would have been in chains 24 hours a day. Which would have made sleep quite difficult, wouldn't it? And there was no bed, just the floor. I don't know about you, but if I, even if I've had a fairly decent sleep in a proper bed, I can easily get grumpy in the morning when I wake up. But here's Paul in prison, more joyful than me at seven o'clock in the morning. Later on in chapter one, Paul talks about how he's uncertain about what's going to happen to him in his life. He was in prison in Rome because he was awaiting trial. And he was due to meet the Roman emperor. Now you can read about that in the book of Acts. The Roman emperor was one of the most powerful men in the world at that time. And the Roman emperor held Paul's life in his hands. And Paul says in chapter one, he might live, he might die, he doesn't know. It's not the kind of place or situation where joy will come naturally, is it? But Paul's joyful. And so whatever it is that brings him joy in a situation like this, it must be something that really matters to the Apostle Paul. There's something so big and so important to the Apostle Paul, it produces circumstance-defying joy in his life. What is it? What is it about the Philippians that he loves? What is this church getting right? Well, verse 3 again. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Partnership in the gospel. That's what matters to Paul. That's what he wants to see in a church. What does it mean? What is partnership in the gospel? It's a really important theme in this whole letter. Um, I'd encourage you, go and read it again later. Read the whole letter through. It won't take you more than 20 minutes. And you'll see this theme of partnership in the gospel coming up again and again. Sometimes it's a word that's translated fellowship, which is a word that as Christians we, we use quite often and perhaps we misuse quite often. And this week I've been reading this book, 
Um, it's called Basics for Believers by Don Carson. It's a great little book on Philippians. Um, and, and I've been reading it these past few weeks. And he says, we tend to think of, you know, if we invite a neighbor around for dinner, that's friendship. If we invite someone for church around for dinner, that's fellowship. Or he says that, you know, what we're doing now is participating in the service. What we're going to do later when we go downstairs and we, we have drinks is fellowship. But that's not really what the Bible means by fellowship. It's not all the Bible means by fellowship or partnership. Partnership has the idea of working together for a common goal. It's a sports team working together to win the match. It's a word from the business world. John and Jim invest together and they start a building business. It's a partnership. There's a cost involved for a common cause. So partnership in the gospel is God's people working together for the gospel. And Paul says in verse 5, from the very first day when he visited and established this church in Philippi. Until now, 10 years later, the Philippians have been faithfully laboring away together with him for the gospel. If you flick over the page to chapter 4, verse 16, you'll see an example of exactly that. Chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. When Paul started this church 10 years earlier, he visited Philippi, and then if you go and read Acts chapter 17, you'll see the next place he went to was Thessalonica. Paul's saying in chapter 4, verse 16, as soon as he left them, as soon as he left them in Philippi, you know, this church would have just been a few weeks old, they heard he was in trouble, and so they quickly sent him help. That's what partnership in the gospel looks like. Or verse 18 talks about the gifts the church sent Paul from Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was a member of this church. And we'll read more about him in chapter 2. The Philippians sent him on a long journey with money and supplies to help Paul in prison. Now it wasn't just because they cared about him. They, they definitely did care about Paul. But they sent him help because they knew he was working for the advance of the gospel. They wanted to support his work. Look back to chapter 1, verse 7. Paul says more about this partnership. He says, Whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you, all, all of you share, literally all of you are partners in God's grace with me. The Philippians have supported Paul through thick and thin, in good times and in bad when he was on his missionary journeys, when he's been in prison. Partnership in the gospel is not merely Christian friendship. It is working together sacrificially, consistently, for the common goal of the advance of the gospel. It's not just evangelism, though. Um, you know, it's definitely not less than evangelism, but there's more to it than that. Um, later on in this letter, we'll see gospel partnership is also about seeing the gospel advance in each other's lives. It's about working together to help each other increasingly live like Jesus. It's about working to help each other live in the light of the gospel more and more and more. Partnership in the gospel is about seeing the gospel progress in the world and seeing the gospel progress in us and working together for that goal that's what this church was doing in Philippi it was costly it was sacrificial they sent Epaphroditus it cost them a person it cost them money they were consistent they were working together for the common cause of the gospel and that is what brings Paul joy joy 
So, so come back to the question we started with. What should we be aiming at at Cornerstone Church? And what does it involve to be a member of Cornerstone Church? Well, I hope it's fairly clear. Paul would want to see this kind of gospel partnership in our church. He'd want to be able to say, I thank God for your partnership in the gospel. He'd want to see a church family partnering together, sacrificially and consistently working together to see the gospel advance in the world and in our lives. What would it look like if we really took that on board? What difference would it make, should it make, to think of ourselves as partners in this kind of way? Well, for a start, I think it should affect the kind of things we do as a church, wouldn't it? It should mean that we're a church that is seeking to advance the gospel in the world and in our lives. We're not to be a social club. Churches can do all sorts of things, can't they? Churches can give their time to all sorts of things. I came across a church not that long ago that on its website, it was very proud of the fact that they were the only church in the country to, who ran their own model railway club. I don't think that's the kind of partnership that Paul is talking about. He's talking about working together for the gospel. That's what we ought to be aiming at. What about us as members of Cornerstone Church? What difference should it make to see ourselves? To personally, what difference should it make to see ourselves in this kind of way? I think that that would be a great question to reflect on this week. What difference would it make to see yourself as a partner in the gospel here at Cornerstone? Let me give you some ideas. I think it would affect why we're here on a Sunday, wouldn't it? Not simply to learn something, but to help each other keep making progress in the gospel. I think it would affect how we think about our money and our time and our houses and our possessions. It will mean using them all sacrificially for the benefit of one another and for the gospel advance in the world. Being partners in the gospel will mean not thinking of ourselves first and foremost, but thinking of ourselves as a team. We'd be willing each other on, won't we, to be the best possible partners in the gospel that we could be. We'll be helping each other when we need it. We'll be helping each other get on with gospel work. I think it'll affect the kind of decisions that we take. Because we're laboring together. We're not individuals whose decisions only affect ourselves. Our decisions can affect our partnership. Being partners in the gospel means we'll be putting our labor for the gospel first, even ahead of our own personal desires. As we read these opening verses of Philippians, we need to ask ourselves, do we see this kind of partnership in our church? And more personally, are we partnering in the gospel in this kind of way? What Paul delights to see in his churches, what he'd long to see in our church, is people rolling up their sleeves and getting involved in the work of laboring for the gospel in all kinds of ways, in the world and in our lives. You know, in God's kindness, I think as I look at Cornerstone Church, I can see that. I can see lots of evidence of partnership in the gospel, and I hope that you can as well. And we should thank God for that, just like Paul thanks God for that too. Well, we need to look at the, the other few verses in this passage. We've thought about Paul's prayer of thanks, what he loves about this church. Now, what about his prayer for the church? What does he hope for them? What does he want for them? Point number two, what, what, what could Paul possibly want for a church like this? It seems like they've got everything sorted, doesn't it? They're doing all the right things. And you might think that Paul would write to them and say, look, you've all worked really hard these last 10 years. Um, take a break. It'd be tempting, wouldn't it, for this church to take their foot off the accelerator. And maybe we might feel like that at times at Cornerstone Church. Let's not do more. Let's sort of take it easy for a bit. But what Paul wants for this church is for them to keep on pressing on. 
because their partnership isn't complete yet. Imagine again with me, John and Jim, they've invested in their building business, they've started their venture, but their, their, their partnership isn't yet complete, it's an ongoing partnership. And it's the same for the Philippians, just look back to verse 6 for a minute. Paul says he's confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, often we take that verse to be the basis for a personal confidence in the work that God is doing in our lives. God began a work in me, and he will complete it in me. And that is gloriously true. But I don't think that's quite what Paul says here. He's talking to the Philippian church, and he's talking about their partnership. And he's saying it's ongoing, it's not complete yet. But he's confident that God will keep it going until it's complete, at the day of Christ. Until Jesus returns, this church needs to keep on pressing on in gospel partnership. And that, that's Paul's concern. That's what he wants for this church. He wants an enduring partnership and an increasingly fruitful partnership. Just look to his prayer, verse 9 to 11. I'm going to read it out again. Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Do you hear the end goal of his prayer? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Think of a field bursting with fruit and crops or a tree that is heavily loaded with with fruit ready to be eaten. He wants the Philippians to be filled to the brim with gospel fruit for Jesus. Do you know apparently we're expecting a 50% increase in strawberry crops this, this year or this month compared to last year? Because the weather apparently has been very warm and dry and there'll be far more strawberries than this year, in this year than last year. I hope it's true because every time I go to the supermarket to buy strawberries, there are never any strawberries. Um, apparently, according to thegrocer.co.uk, there are not enough workers to pick the strawberries. Paul's prayer is for a bumper harvest. A bumper harvest of gospel fruit because of the Philippians' faithful, consistent, costly labor for the gospel. He wants this partnership to bear fruit, more and more and more fruit. And it's not because he's interested in building his empire or his reputation. You know, Paul is not simply interested in the numerical growth of the Philippian church, or building their brand or his brand, www.theapostlepaul.com. He's not interested in how many visits they have to their website or how many views their sermons get on YouTube. What he wants is gospel fruit in the lives of the Philippians that will be for the glory and praise of God. If you feel like, like partnering in the gospel is hard work, Maybe you feel like you'd like to take your foot off the accelerator, take a break for a while. Well, focus your mind on verse 10 and 11, that the picture of 10 and 11, standing before Jesus on the day of Christ, pure and blameless, filled to the brim with gospel fruit, which is for God's glory. Keep pressing on in your partnership, Paul says. Just look at his prayer once again. He tells us, what does this partnership need if it's going to continue to bear fruit? Verse 9, he says, he asked God to give them an increasing love in knowledge and depth of insight. That's the key to fruitful gospel partnership. What does he mean? Does he mean love for God? Or love for one another. Notice he doesn't actually tell us, does he? He just says in increasing love. I think it's probably both. The New Testament tells us, doesn't it? If we don't love God, 
That we, we don't love God if we don't love others. Our love for God is reflected in our love for others. And if gospel partnership is to be fruitful, there's got to be love. There's not going to be sacrificial, consistent working together for the cause of the gospel unless there's love. Later on in the letter, chapter 2, we see that actually that's a problem in this church. They're divided, some of them. They're fighting amongst themselves. And there's people outside the church as well who are opposed to them. How is a church going to stay united in advancing the gospel in a hostile world if they don't care for each other and make sacrificial decisions for one another? Gospel partnership requires love. Paul prays for an increasing love. And if we want our gospel partnership at Cornerstone to be fruitful, then we need to grow in love for one another. And love for God. We need to pray for it. Could you do that this week? Ask God to help us grow in our love for one another. But not simply love, is it? It's it's love with knowledge. Paul doesn't want an indiscriminate love. You know, a love that, that, that says anything goes. A love which is tolerant of everything. He says he wants a love informed by the knowledge of God. True love is informed by what God wants and what God enjoys and what God is pleased with. And if we're growing in that kind of love, then verse 10 says we'll be able to discern what is best. We'll be able to make good decisions. In fact, we'll be able to make the best decisions. Think about this. What difference would it make if you were guided in all your decision making by a love for God and a love for gospel partners? What difference would it make? A love for God and a love for others which is informed by all that God loves and all that God enjoys. Wouldn't that make a difference to your decision making? Don't you think that will make you more fruitful in gospel partnership? When I think about my decisions and my priorities, all too often they're not guided by a love for God and a love for others. They're guided by a love for me. Paul wants us to make decisions which are good for God's glory and good for others. In other words, he wants us to make decisions which are good for gospel partnership, which will result in a bumper harvest at the day of Christ to the glory and praise of God. What would Paul want to see if he came to visit us at Cornerstone Church? What would he want us to be doing? How would he be hoping we'd relate to one another? What would he be praying for us? Well, I think Philippians 1 tells us. He'd want to see people rolling up their sleeves, getting involved in the work of laboring for the gospel in the world and in our lives. He'd want to see a church family partnering together sacrificially, consistently for the gospel, motivated by love for God, love for one another, and a desire to see God glorified by the bumper harvest our work will produce. I don't know whether our ambition, your ambition for our church might be different. Maybe you'd love to see a bigger church or a slicker church or a more professional church. Paul says pray for fruitful gospel partnership. Could you do that this week? Could you pray this prayer for yourself and for Cornerstone this week? That God would help us love him and love one another all the more. so so that we might put the gospel first. Let's pray. Let me pray this prayer for us now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church and for how um, this church in Philippi and how you'd begun a good work in them and how they're such a, a model for us And their relationship with Paul and Paul's relationship with them is a great model for us of faithful, consistent, costly, sacrificial gospel partnership which results in your glory. Lord, we thank you that you've begun a good work in us too. And Father, we do pray that you would carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And Lord, we pray this prayer for ourselves, that our love may abound more and more 
in knowledge and depth of insight so that we might be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. We're going to sing um, a song which is a prayer.